Oh, all right. Okay, um, if anyone has joined us yet, welcome. This is the uh, Women and Femmes of IEN webinar. And we will wait just a few minutes um, until we've got some people joining us and then we'll get started with our program. Welcome everyone. I wish I could see all the people that were joining because I'm sure there's hundreds of you. <laughs> So if you're just joining, this is the Indigenous Environmental Network, and we're just waiting a couple minutes before we start our program, introducing some of the women and femmes of IEN um, to discuss some of our work um, with our communities, um, some of our experiences and thoughts around what Indigenous feminisms may or may not be, um, what kind of things apply to us um, when we talk about feminism, what it means in our communities. Um, do we have a word for it? Um, do we use other words? Um, and what's our experience working in um, our communities and our movements as Indigenous uh, women and femmes? And so that's going to be some of the conversation that we're having today. And please know that we will, um, this is actually sort of a mid-session kickoff of our webinar series. Um, we did have them uh, quite a few times beforehand, but because of some work, we, we um, briefly stopped them. And now we're getting ready to start again. And we thought uh, introducing you to us would be a really great way to start off. So welcome, everyone. Um, we're so happy that you could join us. And we'll just wait a couple more minutes and then we'll start off with the prayer. And so we're just going to wait a couple more minutes here. And cats. And cats. It's all part of the work. They I all know. go up. The yep, most they do. <laughs> My cat is off sleeping somewhere. <laughs> George, the one eared cat. Oh, and um, all right. It's sort of hard for me to judge or to gauge. Usually I could see. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll go ahead and begin. So again, welcome everyone. This is the Indigenous Environmental Networks um, webinar, sort of kickoff for 2022. Um, introducing you to the women and femmes of IEN. Um, we're spread far across the um, Americas, or what is known as the Americas, the so-called Americas. Um, from our homelands, um, from places that we are living, visiting, loving, um, coming to you to talk about our work um, and what it means to us um, as Indigenous women and femmes working in our community on environmental justice um, and even within our own organizations and movements and how we navigate that. Um, and some of the things that we've noticed 
um, some of the feedback we've heard from our communities. These are all things that could be covered. Um, and so without further ado, we're gonna get into it. And I've asked my sister, uh, Joy, um, to start us off with prayer. And so I'll turn it over to her. Um, I'm calling in from my homelands, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe um, here in um, Pocheti Shakoli territory. Um, my sister Simone asked if I would go ahead and say a prayer. Um, so I'll go ahead and start that right now. Uh, I thank you for this beautiful, beautiful red day. Um, we see climate chaos all around us and every single one of us is being affected by it in some way. So I ask you to Kanshula to grant us patience and grant us fortitude and, and grant us um, perseverance to go through these, these trying times uh, to Kanshula. I watch over all of those that are, that are sick or that are coming down with an illness, um, whether it's this, this uh, this uh, COVID-19 or any of the other ones that is coming up, watch over our, our loved ones and especially the Ushula ones, the, the pitiful ones, the ones that, that have a hard time, our elderly, our disabled, our, our little our little ones, our, our children and our baby loves. Uh, watch over the land to Kanshula. There's a lot of healing that the land must go through. And she's being attacked constantly and um, watch over and help protect um, the knee, our sacred water, the Kanshula, and, 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 and watch over everybody that's joining us today, wherever they are, um, to help give them strength and fortitude and courage and perseverance and, and, um, and patience. And most of all, share our love with one another to Kanshula. Midaka ye onyas. Back to you, Simone. Thank you, miigwech, Joy. Thank you so much for that beautiful prayer. And as you were as you were praying, I was just thinking of it. Just brings so much to my mind, um, and how the land is under attack, and the land body connection. And that's one thing that um, I think about in my work. Um, so I'll introduce myself in my language, um, and then say a little bit about the work that I do. And then we're going to pass it around um, to the different staff and contractors of IEN um, to talk about their work too. So I'll start us off. Um, but again, welcome to everyone who's joining. We're so happy that you're here with us, um, that we can share some of our work with you, um, and that to please continue to look out for uh, webinars coming down the line where we'll go deeper into different topics. So first of all, Buju Chinodanikwe Indigenikas, Ms. Kwagami Wizaga Igening and Don Juba and Nikisi and Dudem, Anishinaabe Kwe and Dao, and Bemijigamug and Da. So I am from the Red Lake Nation um, here in Northern Minnesota. Um, my father is from Argentina on the very tip. So I'm like a North South person. Um, and we're Anishinaabe here. And I'm of the Eagle Clan, and I live in Bemidji, Minnesota, at the headwaters of the Mississippi River. Um, these are my homelands. Um, my family is from here from forever. Um, and welcome. So briefly, my position at IEN, the work that I do there, is I've been with IEN for almost uh, 21 years in different capacities and um, have done a gamut of work and always, um, you know, navigating that as an Indigenous woman um, and have learned a lot and thought a lot about that um, through the years. And so I'm just really actually really happy to be able to now have um, a specific project of IEN around Indigenous feminisms um, that I coordinate. And my partner, uh, Benishi, um, she has um, taken another job, but she'll still be joining us here and there, um, sending out her um, some love. Um, and I'm also on the leadership team um, as we work within our organization to um, ensure that women um, and femmes have um, 
official power, right? Because I feel like we've always been the backbone of the movement. We've always been there, um, but it's good that we're intentionally making sure that women are out in front in leadership positions. Um, the other work that I work on briefly is um, the last year I've worked on line three, which is fighting a pipeline going through my precious homelands. Um, and it's been a long, hard fight. Um, and one of the things I wanna mention about that is the strength of the um, women and femmes and two spirits in my community who have been leading a lot of this fight against the pipeline. And many people may have seen it in the news. Um, and just really understanding again, what happens to the land happens to the body. And when we see, especially our own homelands and waters under attack, we feel a physical pain. Um, it's like something you cannot describe unless you, unless it's, unless you experience it. Um, we feel physical pain if we see our rivers being harmed, um, if people, if we see them being treated um, roughly drilled into, dug into, blown up. Um, our aquifers are being pierced here. We're losing all our water, our precious water. Um, we couldn't gather our foods, our traditional foods last year because our lakes were basically mud puddles. So all of that affects us and our families and our ability to live and thrive, to raise our children, um, to be healthy ourselves. It puts a strain on all of our, every aspect of our community when our lands are under attack. It puts strain on relationships within the families. Um, it's an economic problem, it's an economic burden. And so those are some of the things that we work with. And we know that we as indigenous women, we hold a lot of that, right? Like we hold a lot of that um, difficulty. And so for me, I'm really interested in how we hold power, how we shift, um, how we step into our own and make changes. Um, the other thing I'll briefly mention and then and pass it on is um, working with uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women, and that's something that I do very locally here in my community. And right now, um, so the past, past five or six years we've had on February 14th, um, and like a walk and a remembrance and an honoring. And this year, um, we're going to be adding a search to our 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 doings because one of our own, one of the children of a former employee of IEN has been missing since October. And um, so, you know, when we had pipeliners through our community, you know, they left um, around October finally, and that's when she disappeared. And I just can't help but wonder what's going on. And we know that when there's um, all these men in our community that don't have any accountability, that they can sometimes do harm to us. And in fact, they, they were very harmful here. So it's just a lot of that is on our mind, again, that land body connection. So um, I'll stop there, because I really want to hear from um, my sisters and siblings. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to my dear sister, BJ. I had to find the mute button. <laughs> good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, whatever time you're watching this in the moment. I'm BJ McManama. Um, I'm a descendant of the Haudenosaunee of the Seneca, the keepers of the Western Door. And from birth till about the early 70s, I lived in Seneca territory in the southern tier of what we call New York State now. I didn't grow up with all of my people. I was raised by adoptive, adoptive grandparents on their farm and where I first made my connections with the land and our non-human relatives. And all of this that was taught to me by these people has guided me along with what has been shared, also what has been shared with me over the years by my Seneca relatives and other Haudenosaunee peoples who I have become very close to. And all of this is why I continue what I, I do now, my connection to what sustains us, the life around us. Um, and as my sister Simone said, when we see abuse and neglect and exploitation of the land of our relatives, the plant nations, the animal nations, it hurts us, it hurts us inside. And so being who we are, being nurturers and 
mothers and caregivers, you know, it's in our nature to change what we can to bring comfort and, you know, whatever peace and love to those who are suffering and stop, you know, this unimaginable exploitation of our, of our world. So um, I left the New York State in the early 70s and I came to Appalachia. And from almost the first moment I got settled here, I felt like I belonged. I had no reason to think that, but after years of research and, and also snooping around in land records in the courthouse, I found that my peoples were here, as were other tribes and nations like the Cherokee, whom I have sisters and extended family, the Shawnee, the Tuscarora, and many more who sadly are long forgotten. But I always try to remember them when I speak in any situation. You know, I love the mountains and have been here for most of my adult life. I was a coal miner's, miner's wife. I had two children, a son and a daughter, and now I'm a grandma with a, with a granddaughter and two grandsons. I've been married to a Lakota man for 22 years and in, so, in our so-called golden years, um, we are happy and we are thriving. And without this relationship and without this stability, I it would be a lot harder to do what i'm doing so i'm very very grateful for what i have now the blessings and i'm always honored and humbled to be in the com company of my sisters who are all protectors and incorporate elements of our original instructions in whatever we do our work how we live every day this is our way of life always and kind of to explain original instructions very simply they are our ancestral dna within us the design of all life from creator great mystery and faithfully maintained by our mother earth our original mother who gives us life and takes us back into the fold when our time on this plane is over and this understanding is within us and it's what i try to teach people so that they can make the connection so that they will have a vested interest in the things that are going on and the things that we need to change our original instructions do guide us. It's part of our identity as indigenous femmes. It's the voices of our grandmothers, their guiding hand, guiding hand on the web of life. And it's a way of me to visualize our interconnectedness in a way that allows me to keep my balance and it provides me the points of reference for navigating this life. And my tasks and responsibilities with the IAN have been varied over the years. Just lots of worker bee hats, 18 years, and all of the things that I've been able to share, what better way to give back all of the things that have I, I've been uh, that I've learned and obtained from widely varying jobs before I got here. In my work in the educational outreach areas of my campaign, and what I always try to convey is the interconnect connection of all things both the magic and majesty of life, and on the flip side, what we have to change. At the intersections of systemic racism, continued genocide, war, poverty, abuse, and in our face, the climate chaos. And these include, but by no means, are limited to stopping the commodification and purposeful manipulation of nature, genetic engineering, biotech, whatever you wanna call it. The expansion and exploitation from genetic engineering and the industrialization of growing trees and gigantic configurations of monoculture tree plantations. And one of the main reasons is to burn it for energy, which makes absolutely no sense. And from here on the front, front lines in Appalachia, we're fighting the expansion of petrochemicals fracking and the false solutions designed to keep us slaves to the economics of extraction carbon capture, carbon pricing, hydrogen, geoengineering, nuclear energy, and mega hydroelectric projects. This is just a few that I've named. And it's all connected in this capitalist system, the extraction and exploitation economics. I could go on far longer. Everyone who knows me will agree. There is so much to share. The years of watching IEN grow and serve our communities in ways we always prayed for and continue to do so to bring the voices of our people to the communities to the decision makers and the public 
who must walk with us to ensure a safe, peaceful, and prosperous world for the next seven generations. For now, I'll end, and I appreciate your time, and I'm always here. My email's on the website, but it's now my absolute pleasure to pass the microphone off to my sweet, brave, and amazing sister, Eva. Babatash BJ, Kuamon, I love you too. Winina Khan, Wami, Natankosak, Ka Nitonpak, Natasuis, Nonpa Kuanis, Asa, Eva Blake, Nukas, Asuisu, Bonnie Lippincott, Ka Nush, Asuisu, Winsong Blake, Natan, Asuisu, Wanayu Scott, Ka Nanamon, Asuisu, Kwanonu Scott, Natayan, Quinziat, Massachusetts, Nuwampana Manonak, Ka Mua Takunasak, a new word for me. Nutama Sasanit, Wampanak, Ka Nin Nagam. And uh, so in English, I'll say what I, I said in Wampanak. Uh, my name is Little Pearl or Eva Blake. Uh, my mother's name is Bonnie Lippincott. My father's name is Winsong Blake. My daughter is Winayu. My son is Kwananu. Um, and uh, we are Wampanoag and Black. I am from the Asonet Band, Asonet Wampanoag Band, and I use the pronoun Nagam, um, although Nagam really can't be translated into English because um, Nagam, there are no gendered pronouns in our language. Um, so Nagam means he, she, and they all at the same time, which I love. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, right now we live uh, right between the Blue Hills, which is what Massachusetts is named for, uh, and one of the many bays along the Atlantic coast, just south of Boston and uh, north of Plymouth. I was fortunate to be raised within the ancestral land of my people um, on the south coast of the mainland part of the state uh, with strong community bonds. Uh, Wampanoag uh, means people, Eastern people, uh, the want part referring to the east and the ak at the end referring to which is the uh, the plural animate for uh, for people um, we are the receivers of the sun from across the ocean as it returns each morning to the eastern gate of turtle island um, or as stationary sun believers would say uh, as turtle uh, turtle island herself turns the bend of her own uh, orbit uh, moving back towards the sun, father sun, as she spins through time. Um, living here in Dawnland, we are mostly known as the people of the first light. Uh, we are fishing and shell fishing people. We are the children of whalers and sailors and clam bake makers. We are hunters and foragers, wampum belt and blueberry slump makers. Um, some of us are not recognized as real Indians by the feds. Um, others of us are. There are two federally recognized tribes within our nation, uh, that at Aquina and Mashpee. Uh, all of us are survivors of attempted genocide, and all of us have been experiencing uh, the ongoing nightmare of uh, living under colonial rule for just over 400 years now. Um, here, our territories include Patuxet, uh, the ancestral lands of the Herring Pond Wampanoag, uh, which are best known for a little pebble that uh, some invaders supposedly stepped on when they uh, came out of their, their ship. Um, after sailing around Cape Cod <laughs> with arrows flying at them, um, digging up graves and stealing corn from our storage pits. So I'm sure you've heard the story. Um, I work for IEN as a philanthropic manager, uh, AKA resource manager, um, AKA capitalist. Um, the hardest part of my job is really wondering, um, you know, whether I'm selling out and upholding systems of oppression <laughs> by being part of, you know, the wheels of philanthropy and being part of, of capitalism with, with what I do, um, um, you know, my mechanism here. Um, as an anti-capitalist, I definitely struggle with the idea that um, Maybe money is not even capable uh, of creating the post-capitalist, post-colonial, anti-racist and feminist economies that we are dreaming and, and trying to bring into being. Um, 
So I struggle with that a lot. But since we are still using money, um, I also think a lot about how to get more of it into the hands of the grassroots frontline movers and shakers. Um, so that's my role at IEN right now. Um, the way that I my work got involved uh, with the feminism's work um, here was first by participating as a student in the uh, uh, International Feminist Organizing School. It's called the Berta Caceres International Feminist Organizing School, um, and it was um, it was uh, launched last year. It involved uh, 140 women um, using four different languages, um, all from all over Mother Earth. Um, and uh, after the school, I teamed up with some of the resource mobilizers from our partnering organizations, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, um, Grassroots International, and the World March of Women um, to um, start. Well, we did a, a, a funder briefing first to just introduce some of the principles and, and things to the funder community. Um, and also then launched um, what we are calling the uh, Funder Organizing Committee for the Future of Feminist Organizing School. Um, we, there, we've been doing this in International Feminist Organizing School. Um, IEN has put on an Indigenous Feminist Organizing School. Um, but for the future of these schools, we, we, we do need to fundraise. Um, however, the purpose of this group is not just to fundraise for these, but also to um, use the Funder Organizing School's political education tools um, within our spheres of influence to better support uh, the transitioning of our communities uh, to feminist, anti-racist, post-capitalist, and regenerative economies that uphold Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. Um, I was just lastly going to name the members of that group, um, which is the EDGE Funders Alliance, Solidaire Network, the Malala Fund, Thousand Currents, Human Rights Funders Network, Wellspring, Thesis Capital, and Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. Um, so we're all women working within philanthropy, uh, women and femmes, um, also non-gender non conforming uh, peoples who are very passionate um, about women's liberation. And, um, and so uh, that's, that's a little tidbit on uh, how my work intersects with, with this topic. I'm gonna pass this hot potato over to my sister, Mia Johnson. Ah, oh, that was so great. Thanks, Eva. Um, well, um, Eva and I actually are a, a technically neighbors of neighboring, and, and, but I am actually a guest in her territory. Um, so Mia, she, they, um, I live in so-called Boston, um, which is even beautifully described on the territory here of the Wampanoag peoples. Um, been a guest of their territory for um, about 20 years, almost 21 years. Um, originally was adopted and raised in, um, in the West Coast, um, outside of Tillamook in Oregon. And um, so, yeah, so long story, but um, the, end, the end of that story is that um, through the process of adopting and meeting my birth parent family, I learned that I was Mescalero and Chiricahua Apache and had then was put on a, a track to, to learn and understand and was uh, gifted um, for a time until my, my aunt passed um, the knowledge of our people and the ways in which that was taught to me um, and to be the keeper of some knowledge that um, has been in our family um, for centuries. So, um, I feel very lucky to be here. Um, I know one day I'll go, I'll return home. Um, I know that because my aunt told me I would be, so I didn't really feel like, a, now that she's an ancestor, I feel like, a, uh, yep, I have no choice. So, <laughs> um, you know, we're a worse society and a matrilineal society. Um, and my aunt was very clear about directions and uh, she continues to be very clear today um, when I'm now following them. So. Um, very happy to uh, be here and talking about indigenous, indigenous femmes and what does it mean to be who we are in this world and all the ways that we show up um, and to understand the ways that we show up through colonization and genocide. And um, for me personally, I like to be really clear that as, a, as an indigenous person that um, was not 
able to be raised within their community and able to be um, because of genocide, because of colonization, because of separation through um, uh, the round that I went into, which was a foster care system, and previously other folks who have gone through residential schools and child separation. Um, but these are ongoing. This is a lived and ongoing lived experience for our communities um, about what does it mean um, to be who we are and how we show up. And so I'm always very clear that I identify as an urban Indian because 70% of our people have had to remove themselves or been removed um, from their close community um, based on survival, whether it has been through the immediate removal because of the state or been removal because there hasn't been in, um, access to food or jobs or a way to maintain one's survival within their community um, because of implications of um, the real um, harm that the state plays against our people um, that is constant. And as many of um, the women and femmes here have raised and will continue to raise the issues that we um, face and um, continue to uh, fight back against. So anyway, I say all that uh, because it brought me this table of really um, of understanding and um, wanting to continue to show up and figure out how do I hold that given the knowledge that I have around solidarity economy work and looking at um, what is the economic injustice and you know as an as a living example of having experienced economic injustice and the harm harm that it, it has gone through to be here right to know that my birth mother um experienced harm um based on addiction and things that are very very common in our communities they're not it's not uncommon um and this is all based on genocide and the intentional erasure of our people the intentional attack against particularly our femmes and so, you know, with me, with a deep heart, I hold her in me. And I also understand that, like, she's on her journey. And I hope that one day she will find her way back, you know. But that is the reality of our people. And it is not the only reality. We also are gifted these stories and knowledges to then take and, and bring them into the fight. And part of that is what BJ spoke to, the larger fight of all the things that are happening, not only to our, our bodies, our encasement of our land and our waters, but the encasement literally of the land and waters that house all of us. And so I, I, I get to hold the honor of holding the work as a divestment campaigner for IEN. I've been here for the last several months. You know, um, I started in August. I've been doing environmental justice work and organizing communities for over 18 years and working specifically in, in particularly with frontline communities and families and particularly young families um, around fighting for their rights to clean air and energy. And so with that, I'm very honored to continue to sit at this table and to learn with all of you and from all of you and to share any knowledge and skills that I may have been gifted, just as my auntie saw that I was removed so that I could survive, to be put back in to community so that I could thrive. I hope that I'm able to give that and offer that to all of you. Um, I would like to, uh, I would like to offer the space uh, to Idris, um, who is um, also experiencing um, some of the harm that has come from, come from these journeys um, in her homelands um, uh, in, in these so-called border areas. Thank you, Mia. Hi, everybody. Kuali uh, Yowali, buenas noches. Good evening. My name is Iris Rodriguez. I am Tonkawa Karankawa, so-called Chicana and Cuban. I was born and raised in my mother's ancestral lands of Yacatzul de Cate and Yanaguana Somisec, otherwise known as the so-called Edwards Plateau and San Antonio, Texas. So I come from in between the ancient forest and the big city barrio. I did not grow up in my traditional life ways, but I've done my best uh, to reconnect to it for my own healing and for my children. To this day, my peoples are also not federally recognized. I'm now in my eighth year in exile, asserting my sovereignty here in Nahua and Tarasco lands in so-called Mexico with my children. I'm the web designer and admin for Indigenous Environmental Network. I'm also a digital native um, involved as a strategist, artist, writer, and producer in a number of different fronts and projects across the continent. 
for the past 18 years um, uh, through websites, indigenous music, films, podcasts, popular education, or just outright do or die resistance, survival, creation, innovation. I've been a part of different things um, that assert indigenous and matriarchal sovereignty and serve to defend the sacred waters of the womb, earth, and sky. I work with people and communities in crisis to assert sovereignty and digital power by taking up space online, sharing our stories and our voices and creating digital footprints and codices that can never be burned. Um, some of the projects and, and efforts I've been a part of include um, mobilizing to liberate children and families from family prisons, we were uh, one of the ones to break the story about the Central American women in detention having forced abortions and forced hysterectomies. Um, I've been a part of projects that track US weapons into Mexico. I've uh, been a part of international mapping projects that track border patrol points and points of aid, humanitarian aid as people cross. Um, I've been a part of projects that bring my sisters and relatives from the north here into Mexico to uh, re take back our traditional birthing practices and step into parteria. Um, and I've done a number of things, documentary films P uh, that have been on PBS, like a whole bunch of things, anything I can get my hands on really. My work is behind the screen, um, but most of it sits in front of the digital fireplace in between the World Wide Web and the Web of Life. Um, but for sure, my most important work is my fireplace at home with my family. Um, what does indigenous feminism mean to me? Uh, to me, it's restoring the matriarchy and respect for the divine feminine. It's doing the healing work of seven generations backwards and forwards, understanding that everything we do in the microcosm is also reflected in the macrocosm. It means loving ourselves, being radical with our rest, loving our sisters, lifting each other up, checking each other with love when needed or checking up to ask just, how are you? Connecting with intention. Um, for me, it has meant taking a stand against injustice as needed and asserting sovereignty in different ways. Um, it has meant coming to the understanding uh, that colonization attacks and tries to incarcerate us uh, our bodies from inside, from the mind, to the gut, to the womb, and I am a survivor. It also, indigenous feminism means doing the work to uplift Black and indigenous femme non-gender conforming voices, voices of the incarcerated, of the oppressed, because our liberation is intertwined. It means divesting from corporate structures, processes, and products, and investing in indigenous and matriarchal communities and local community. It means taking our mind, our bodies and tongues back, taking our memories, stories and words back, taking our taste buds back so that colonization doesn't cause us that inside inflammation. You know, uh, it's also about doing the work, showing up, incorporating it to our daily practice, um, doing what we need to to get back into balance uh, and well-being as people, as circles, as nature with nature. I never really thought about indigenous feminisms as a thing. Um, but for me, in my life, it has been medicine. And I want to go scream from the mountain shops and tell all my sisters, you know, hey, another world is possible. Let's dream it up. Let's do it. Um, so that's check for me. And um, it's an honor to share this space uh, with all of you. And with great love, I know uh, give the mic over to Shaw. Shaw, who is here, by the way, but now turning over to video. We're not. Okay, I guess I'm doing this on video. And I'm going to do it with the unicorn thing on my head because I'm feeling festive. 
my name is Shah. I am the media coordinator um, here at IEN. I apparently am the resident goofball today. Um, I do digital illustration, digital uh, like media production work. I do graphic design. Um, I troll people on social media as part of my job. Um, and feminism is a cool term and all, but it doesn't cover everything for us. Um, at least for me, I grew up in a matrilineal community. And so to call it feminism doesn't really, um, it doesn't cover everything. Like I didn't grow up hearing about women's rights and that we had rights. I grew up hearing that I'm the woman, I'm in charge of things. I have responsibilities to my community because we run our community. And that goes beyond the Western concept of feminism. Um, and then outside of IEN, I continue to troll people and I irritate people in positions of power and authority. And I make memes and yeah, that's really what I do for IEN. And I am calling in from Portland, better known as Stolen Multnomah Land. And I am going to pass this over to my sis, Ashley. I'll actually kick it over to our um, relative Ponganga and then um, get back on track. Thanks, Ashley. Um, thanks for letting me step in. I kind of had to step in last minute. My uh, son was uh, tested positive for COVID earlier. And so all of our, all of our families have had, um, you know, some setbacks uh, due to the pandemic. And I'm, I'm so happy that everybody's willing to be flexible with me and allow me to come into this space um, kind of in the middle. Uh, so wanga atka banganga nang naka bangawi wanga ataka alnachama um naka Kirsten Nuvak Pass uh wanga sibunga me so I'm from um Sibunga on St. Lawrence Island. Uh it's an island between uh Sitnasak, Alaska and Russia or Chikutka. Um and I come from a long line of femmes or women. Um, have done a lot to serve their communities. My um, grandmother on my dad's side, she uh, was sent away at age 20 um, to a tuberculosis hospital in Seattle after she already had uh, many children. She, she had to be sent away and taken away for a whole year from her community. Um, my dad's my dad's grandmother that helped raise him or did raise him, she lost her eyesight to German measles during um, the outbreak on St. Lawrence Island because she continued caring for people um, even after they were diagnosed. And, and so she knew it was important to take care of her community. I come from an island that was 99% wiped out due to um, multiple events. One of them was Krakatoa, um, which caused two straight winters in Alaska. The elders talk about that. And also due to the, um, the decimation of the whale population when the European whalers came and um, wanted to extract oil and baleen from one um, ecosystem in, in our community and many other communities, and it caused a widespread famine. Um, so 99% of us were wiped. Um, and another way that extractive industry has impacted us um, because extractive industry, capitalism, patriarchy, racism, they're military. Uh, we actually had a, a military base on our island um, that was supposed to, uh, it was supposed to support 200 troops for two years. And when they were finished with that base, they said, uh, cut the lines, take a backpack and leave. Um, and so they cut all the fuel lines, the chemical lines, and they spilled everything out into a lagoon. And now um, that lagoon, um, they just started cleaning it up about a decade ago, uh, maybe a little bit 
a little bit longer, but it had been around since um, it was abandoned in the 70s. And so anybody who learned how to swim in that lagoon, anybody who ate fish from lagoon, um, it's a, a matter of when you get cancer, not if. And so um, through my family line, I've experienced our bodies being treated as sacrifice zones to determine um, what is safe um, for non-Indigenous people or um, we're treated as sacrifice zones because we're expendable. And so the dirty work can be done on our lands. And so IAN has hired me as their uh, climate geoengineering organizer. And geoengineering is another way uh, that extractive industry uh, has treated our bodies like sacrifice zones because these technologies, these false solutions are being tested exclusively on indigenous lands without our free prior and informed consent. Um, it is so important for gender, non-binary and femme people to be included in these conversations, to lead these conversations, because we are some of the most oppressed people um, based on extractive industry, uh, on capitalism, militarism, all of those ways intersect. Um, our, our bodies are tied, we're tethered so closely to the land um, that you can see, you know, as long as the land is mistreated, is raped, is um, being decimated, so are our bodies. Um, we see that reflected in the way that um, indigenous femmes, indigenous non-binary people are treated. Um, I forgot to start my timer and I can't even see Simone, where are you? <laughs> Am I still good on time? Yep, you're, you're, um, if you wanna pass it on, you're good on time. Okay, um, I will kick it back to uh, somebody that I admire a lot, um, somebody that I really look up to. Ashley, thank you for letting me cut in front of you. Thank you, Panganga. And um, yeah, hi, everyone. Halako uh, ke, hoisi ye no lako, nata ya PAC netai kopi. I just introduced myself to you in my Shawnee language. My name is Ashley Nicole Ingle. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I am from the absentee Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma. I'm also Oglala and Chichangu Lakota. And I come from the Deer Clan of the Shawnee tribe, and my fam my Oglala families are Lamont, Apple, and Horn Cloud, and my Shichangu families are Spotted War Bonnets and White Buffalo Chiefs. And this is actually my great grandmother, um, Agnes White Buffalo Chief Lamont. And uh, definitely, I've been very blessed um, to have you know a very strong lineage of you know women who um, have. You know, really pushed forward um, matrilineal our matrilineal culture. I definitely was raised, you know, by my Lakota family, um, and definitely reconnected with my Shawnee people um, as I became an adult. And so, you know, I'm really blessed um, to have access to both of my um, people's cultures. Um, and I, I'm currently living here in um, so-called Oklahoma, which is um, also known as Indian Territory. And this is actually the land that my people, along with you know many other tribes here were forcibly removed to on different death marches from the East Coast. And so the Shawnee people were actually Algonquin. Um, Shawnee just means Southerner in the Algonquin language. And so, you know, we were up there with, you know, Eva and Mia and um, BJ. Um, but um, with the onset of colonization, of course, we were moved more and more west. And the reason why we're called absentee Shawnee is because we actually absented ourselves from the reservation that they tried to force us on. And we ran away to what is now so-called Mexico. Um, and so we have actually a very deep relationship with our relatives down in Eagle Pass and um, some Mexican Kickapoo um, people who, you know, at different times um, kept, um, kept um, our communities thriving. And so eventually, we were uh, rounded back up and um, dropped here in Oklahoma um, alongside um, 39 other tribes um, and many more that were actually absorbed into those tribes. Um, and, you know, the, the, the life here in Oklahoma and, you know, this is, you know, very similar to many other communities, but I think, you know, Oklahoma in particular um, is a really hard place to live for Indigenous people um, because we had that violent beginning um, and because this is where, you know, the oil boom actually 
actually brought in um, colonization and white settlers who literally uprooted us from our very lands that we had just been removed to. Um, my tribe actually is considered a squatter tribe because we never entered into any agreements with the United States. And so we don't actually have a land base. And one of the tribes that did, um, and this is just, you know, an example of how colonization, you know, divides and conquers us. Um, another tribe had actually um, sold um, sold their um, indigenous um, history um, to become citizens, and they are actually currently encroaching upon our tribal um, headquarters in Shawnee and able to like move their fence. They're like right next door, and it's it's just you know really ugly um, because that's that's our reality. Um, Oklahoma is the pipeline crossroads of the world, and that's you know this is you know bringing me back to where. Uh, the conversation around, you know, why I'm here at IEN, why I'm doing this work, and why I feel that it's connected to our lives as FEMS. And, you know, this is the pipeline crossroads of the world. Just yesterday, there was a 4.5 earthquake that um, shook northern Oklahoma, which is where I currently live. And these are man-made earthquakes. Um, they're a result, um, result of fracking. And Oklahoma actually is, you know, experiencing an up um, from 2014 all the way up until now has experienced more earthquakes um, than many other places, um, all because of fracking. We didn't have earthquakes at all um, really before 2013. And that's, you know, that coincides um, with the with the fracking boom um, that happened up north um, with our relatives up north on the northern side of the plains. And so, you know, um, living here in Oklahoma, um, being Lakota and being Shawnee, having family up in the Northern Plains and down here on the Southern Plains, you know, just really seeing how our whole strip um, of states are really just treated like flyover states um, when really so much is happening here, you know, has really, you know, made me feel very passionate about bringing up these subjects in national spaces. And so I'm the Green New Deal coordinator with the Indigenous Environmental Network. Um, I'm really glad to be in this position and really happy to serve our communities in this way because it's vital that we demand and that we push forward a just transition that is based on Indigenous values, principles, and, and really knowledge um, because we know that we're the communities, we're the people who are fighting um, to ensure that there is a future that our, our children and our grandchildren can have and live in and thrive. Um, and so, you know, some of the work that I do here at IEN, it really is very diverse because there is a need for a diversity of tactics and strategies to really push forward, you know, this new future that we desperately need. And so this ranges all the way from, you know, doing trainings and interfacing directly with grassroots communities, all the way up to engaging in policy. And, you know, what, the thing that I really love about the policy work we're doing here is that we actually show up to those to those offices, you know, when when um, when they're not doing the things that we need them to do. And so I'm really happy about the work we're doing here. Um, that's just a little bit about what's happening here in Oklahoma. And I'm going to go ahead and kick this up to my sister up on the northern plains uh, candy. Thank you, Ashley. So in my head out the language, I said hello, relatives. My name is Eagle Woman. Also, Candy White from what is now so called North Dakota. I am Mandan, Hidadza, and German on my dad's side. I am Arikara, Chippewa, Norwegian, and French Canadian on my mom's side. I am also the Waterbuster and Prairie Chicken clans and grew up um, in what is now called the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, you know, by the, by the government, the names they give us. All the way from Head Start through graduation, I went to Newtown uh, schools in Newtown, North Dakota with my mom during the school year and then with my dad in Twin Buttes during the summers where I swam like a little fish in Lake Sacagawea every single day and climbed hills. The Badlands was my backyard I was exploring caves. Somehow I miraculously never got bit by snakes or you know anything like that running around, you know, all the time without a care. It was um, it was just a really 
spiritual place and time that I didn't even realize until I got older. We grew up eating the foods that our grandma told us about, you know, finding the turnips. It was always kind of like a game. And we dig them up, see who can dig them up the fastest and eat them right there and have dirt all over our faces and the ground berries and the sand cherries and probably stuff we probably shouldn't have been eating, but we found out, you know, oh, don't eat that. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it was really idyllic for me, just being a kid growing up on the reservation, learning. Um, I always talked about myself as like walking in two worlds, really. It was kind of difficult. I got into a lot of fights in elementary school because, you know, there'd be white girls. I'd say, why are you hanging out with the native girls? And native girls would want to hang out with white girls. And it's like, I was friends with everybody. I was talking to everybody and it would cause tension sometimes and it was caught cause problems sometimes. And uh, I'll say this, I never started a fight. I only ever defended myself um, as, as what I always considered a little scrappy person. And that came from my grandma, you know, Swana Young Bear, she is, she is known for being mean and scrappy. <laughs> and she would always tell me things like, you know, it doesn't matter what other people think of you. You know, don't worry about what they, what other, it's none of your business what other people think of you. And we grew up matrilineal. We grew up in this, this society um, similar to what my sisters have said about just women have roles and these are the roles that you play. But I really wanted to get off the res. I went to school and um, that's when I started learning that life isn't that idyllic. You know, I knew that there were problems, but to me, cancer was a normal thing. A lot of our people had it. And then I was diagnosed with cancer and I survived and other people didn't. And I wanted to like protect the sacred, I guess. So when I went into natural resource and park management, it was cool for a while, but it was like, we we're saving like this little piece of land and, and these resources so that we could like ruin the rest, you know? And I didn't like that. And it was all catered to people and to the human population to come and see these things, you know? And so after working in state and national parks, um, and the reason I did that was because my older sister, Carrie, went to school and she was a strong woman. And my older auntie mom, Amy, went to school and she was a strong woman. And so I was always influenced by these women in my life. And I was, um, I was working on fighting a proposed oil refinery by a group that was run by women in my community. The, the, the names have changed over the years. You know, there was, there was like SOAR and now there's Fort Berthold Power. And I was influenced by these really strong women that were leading these groups. And I was seeing that it was women that were taking the charge. But I also wanted people to like respect me. And during my time and even now, some people look at that degree and, and it means something to them, you know? And that's what was my mind frame at the time. Like if, if I'm gonna get these men to listen to me, I have to like go get this, you know, education. And it was crazy because that's when I really learned how different growing up on the res was compared to being outside the res and how different men and women had roles outside of the res. And I really learned a lot by leaving you know, it's six o'clock. Oh, that's my computer. Sorry. But um, anyways, I just wanted to say that I started working with IN in 2007 because I went back to school for my degree in environmental management and I hit the ground running and started learning about fracking. Fracking came to my homelands and it made a lot of people sick and it's still making a lot of people sick, particularly women. It, it messes with our um, reproductive systems. It messes with women that don't even have babies yet. It messes with our children and our ability to reproduce. And it's been a struggle to do nonviolent direct actions within my community and in my territory and the Mandan Hidat Zervikara nations, which has been in the Bakken oil boom since around 2007. Um, when you say the word environment at home, there's a lot of pushback. It's like you're a negative person for wanting to fight. But I remember doing tree plantings with the Boys and Girls Club, doing community gardens, doing the Protecting Mother Earth gathering at Fort Berthold in 2011, doing the uh, workshops on just transition and what does that even mean? What is that buzzword? How can we um, initiate it on Fort Berthold? And also doing water blessing and healing walks at home with women in my group and then COVID hit. And so trying to do all these things at home, trying to push back a bit against my own tribal council, which is really contentious and really hard to do. And people get mad at you. People got mad at me when I would do that because I would say, what are we doing for renewable energy? What are we doing for 20 years after fracking is gone and all this oil is gone? How are we protecting our future? And so it'd be really contentious and hard. And I just wanna say that as of now, 
I'm just coming back from a really dark place, like um, with the, the pandemic and with COVID and carrying the burden of this on our shoulders as women is really, really hard. My sisters have been telling their stories, but I got to be myself in a really dark place that I, I just was felt like I was failing as a mom, failing as a wife, failing as an employee of IEN. And I just wanted to say to all the women and all the people that are watching right now as I wrap up my time, that it's okay to be in a dark place sometimes, that it's normal to feel the heavy burden of this work that we do, because it's not easy. But coming back into the light with my sisters here is a really beautiful thing. And coming back into myself and who I am and how I am a strong person to continue the fight and not give up and not let other people take advantage of me and make me feel like I'm not worthy enough because I am. And you are too. If you're listening and you've been in that place, you're not alone. So I'll just say odds. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it on to a beautiful youth that we are fortunate to have on our staff that has been working with us for a while and learning a ton in the time that she's been with us. So I'll pass it over to you, Morgan. Hello everyone, my name is Morgan Brings Funny. My Lakota name is Owiskanwi, which means wet earring. I am from Shine River um, Sea Reservation. That's my hometown where I grew up. Um, I had grown up on and off the reservation and grew up in the movement thanks to my mom. Um, I am a social media intern. I had been learning a lot throughout the past year. And like I knew that I had started like working to fight against pipelines like KXL, um, Dakota Access, and now I'm working against to fight against line three and line five. And I'm still learning that there are other works to be done, like carbon marketing, pricing, um, the fossil fuel industry, and what's happening to our world, our own Chimaka. And there's a lot there's definitely is a lot and there's a lot of information to pack in and i am one of the seventh generation um that my ancestor crazy horse had talked about that the seventh generation is going to start standing up and fight against what's happening as they stood against uh what was happening then for our future for our safety and now being part of that seventh generation i am fighting for my grandkids my future children and for the next seven generations ahead and so um thank you all for listening here i'm going to pass it over to my mom joy braun oh thank you jokes yeah that's my kid I can be proud. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I introduced myself earlier at the beginning of this of this of this webcast. But um, Chante waste na peti za happy wambli weakali imati happy na um wambli paha um uh is where is where I'm living right now, Eagle Butte. So I live I live on my reservation, the Cheyenne River Sioux reservation here within the heart of of uh, Ocheti Shakoi territory um what some people call the great Sioux nation not that that's what they signed on the those treaties 1868 1851 great Sioux nation really were the Ocheti Shakoi um let me tell uh and and I'm the I'm the national pipelines uh, organizer for IEN for Indigenous Environmental Network, and that 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 came out of because I had been fighting Keystone XL for over ten years, and of course, in the middle of that fight, um, we we were fighting Dakota Access Pipeline too. 
up there and uh, on the banks of the Cannibal. When the um, grassroots people of Standing Rock called and said, they caught what they did is they called some of us Keystone XL pipeline fighters because we had a, a one. <laughs> We, we won we won against KXL several times. This was one of the times we had won. So they called they called some of us up on me and um, my 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 good friend, my good sister Mushke, um Paula Antoine over there in um, Rosebud and asked, you know, what can we do to help stop this pipeline, this Dakota Access pipeline? See, I knew about that pipeline ahead of time, about a whole year ahead of time, but I can't go into anybody's territory um, unless I'm asked to do that. That's something that one of my mentors, um, Deb Whiteplume, uh, taught me. Uh, Deb Whiteplume, uh, an amazing matriarch that has passed on, is now one of our ancestors up there in the, the Star Nation watching over us. Uh, she taught me a lot of things about nonviolent direct action and about uh, respecting each other's territory. So I can't go into anybody's territory unless I'm asked. And so we were asked to go up there to Standing Rock. Um, and we did, and uh, had some meetings beforehand. And there was a horse ride and we set up camp. And uh, me and my, my cousin, Wiaka Eagleman, um, we were the first campers up there at Sacred Stone. And I mentioned that because it's important that, that, that we are talking about, about regaining our power as, as indigenous women and femmes. Um, but there, there's also a balance um, with our men. Um, you know, it takes two wings of a bird for, for humanity to fly, men and women. And our men are broken. There's a lot of stuff has happened to our men. But a hell of a lot more has happened to our women. And we have to learn to to help heal one another and not allow colonialism colonialistic constructs and I would I would argue Christianity constructs of what it is to be male and female or femme, um, or non binary or whatever, to have those things pushed on us if forced into our current cultural dynamic. Um, I would argue that we need to clean a lot of that shit out. Oh, excuse me. Clean a lot of that stuff out. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna try to cuss bad at that. To clean a lot of that stuff out and really start looking at, at one another and out healing one another. Uh, so there was me and Wiaka there at the beginning. And of course we both stayed till the end. Um, up at Standing Rock. But after that, you know, the the fight for mine, mine three, and then the transitional fight um, from camps on the ground to to how, how they're fighting now. And, and, and that fight continues with mine three, just as the fight for DAPL continues. And um, we did want one Keystone XL, but there's a lot other fights around the country. On line five, again, we've got treaty issues along line five. You got Mountain Valley Pipeline. We've, we've won a couple things with Mountain Valley. They're still going to try to push things through just as they did with Dakota Access. Remember, Dakota Access is an illegal pipeline. And there's a lot more pipelines. And anywhere you're going to have uh, fracking, um, there's going to be additional pipelines. And that's just the gas and oil. Because another thing is coming up in the in the whole whole so-called United States called on carbon pipelines and carbon capture and sequestration. I can't even say the word right because I got no teeth. But the they the, these these plants where they want to capture the carbon from the air or capture it from big calf holes, big um, pig farms, big turkey farms, big big cow farms and capture the ethane, you capture the carbon and they want to put it through these pipelines and then they want to take this carbon at, at a high intensity and then pipe it, push it through. Um, one of them, they want to go along the Dakota Access Pipeline route 
because they want to push it through. And, uh, so some of them want to want to go through the old Keystone XL route, uh, trying to get a hold of neighbors and people down there. But they want to push them through and then deposit them underground. Now, you heard my sister Ashley up there before talk about earthquakes in Oklahoma and how they're man-made earthquakes uh, caused by fracking. Well, one of the places that they want to put these this carbon is up in North Dakota in a in shale bed. And they want to use the carbon to inject into wells that would normally be dead already and continue fracking. But by doing that, it's going to unstabilize the geographics the geology, and there could be a huge carbon explosion. Carbon pipelines, when they explode, they, they don't leak. What they do is they explode. They go kaboom. And it's a big, huge kaboom. <laughs> so so we, we've got to keep that up. up, up. And, and as you know, we're talking about about some of the things that, that happen. This is all part of this, these false solutions. Well, let's capture all this carbon and let's scrub the air, which they, they, they try to say, oh, it's 47%. It's not 47%, it's more like 14% that these, these big carbon scrubbers do. They're, it's unproven technology, they don't work. Anyway, they wanna say, look at these bright, shiny objects that we're gonna do. And so that these polluters can keep polluting. These polluters can keep polluting. These polluters can keep attacking Umsi Maka. These polluters can keep causing cancer, not only in places where that are next to fracking fields, but also in places that are next to uh, refineries and, um, and huge issues in California around refineries and what happens there. Um, but there's all these places need pipelines to interconnect with one another, whether they're a 12 inch pipeline or a 42 inch pipeline. So we, we, we have to connect our fight together. And, and when we talk about, about feminism, um, back in the 70s, it must have been mid 70s, because it was uh, President Carter. Uh, my mom, Sandra Frazier, she was being honored up there in um, at the White House around the Equal Rights Amendment, which didn't pass yet. They're starting to revive oh, it. Joy, so about about thirty more seconds, my 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 love. Thirty more seconds. Okay. See, I can talk forever. But anyway, <laughs> we love it though. <laughs> but the, the feminism has gone on within my family for a really long time. My mom got a big, huge award, big silver thing by the president. But I, I and, and my grandma did a lot of things. There's a long history about matriarchal powerhouses in our family. And um, look into your family. You're going to find sheroes in your family. You're going to find find women that have done amazing things. I guarantee it. Anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet now because I, I can talk forever. I'm sorry to have to um, cut you off like that. That's the, the hard part about being timekeeper because actually I could listen to you and uh, everyone else for a really long time. There's just so much knowledge, um, so much experience, so much to share in this group. Um, and I want to acknowledge the ones who weren't able to join us today. Um, we had uh, Chelsea and Jennifer. And again, um, keeping them in our, our hearts and uh, the audience, the listening audience will get to hear them later on when they talk about some of their stuff because these webinars are going to continue um, featuring much of what we've talked about, um, many of the staff and contractors here to delve deeper into um, the rich um, content of this conversation. And we only have about 15 minutes. I'm going to just um, do a couple summarizing things. And then if anyone else has um, anything they want to add. And again, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Um, so one of the things that really stood out was when we talk about um, feminism and how um, 
how does that relate to the balance that is usually within our communities um, between the different genders, um, the interconnectedness, and that feminism isn't necessarily a word that we've always had. Um, a lot of languages don't have words, a word for feminism. Um, and yet we find ourselves um, in this situation where we are living in um, a world that has um, a worldview, um, a cosmology that has been imposed upon us that um, embraces uh, oppression of women. In fact, it's it necessitates our, the system that we're living in necessitates the oppression of women and femmes. Um, and that um, even our own communities, we've internalized that patriarchy, um, that capitalism, all of that. And so as we untangle that, as we pull those threads out, um, sometimes um, words like feminism um, are tools to help us think through because we've had this imposition. And so sometimes we have to un unravel it. And I really um, also want to talk about um, everyone's, as I was listening to you all uh, introduce yourselves, everyone was talking about your grandmas, um, your parents, where you grew up, um, even your adopted families, your homelands, um, because we as Indigenous peoples always recognize our relationships, that that's who we are. Um, our relationships are connected to our homelands, to our families, um, to our experiences um, with each other, with water, um, you know, that swimming story that you showed, that you shared, Candy. I was thinking about where I grew up swimming too and how much that meant to me. You know, I can still feel the dirt between my toes. I can still smell the path that I walked down to get to that water. And I think a lot of us have that experience um, in one way or another with um, being interconnected beings. And so even like um, all my relations or metakiase, like those are things that say that we are all part of creation. Um, we're not just stewards of the land. No, we are the land. We are mother earth. We are the water. Um, and the other thing I wanted to bring up is the difference between rights and responsibilities. A lot of times we talk about our responsibilities as indigenous women and femmes um, to our communities, to our families, to each other and to our homelands. And that's usually how we operate when we're land and water defenders, right? It's our responsibilities. Um, that keeps us humble and it keeps us strong. Um, and I just want to lift that up as one of the differences that I've definitely noticed. Um, no, not so much talking about our rights to things, although we can still talk about our power um, and that we should step into positions um, of influence and power. And um, uh, let's see a couple other things. Oh, mean grandmas. I love that. Mean grandmas and aunties are the best teachers ever. Like, you know, a couple, a look from my mom. I already know what she's going to say. I already know I've overstepped. I already know what I've done. I already know I got to clean it up. Um, my mom's the one who can talk the most uh, straight to me. You know, she'll say things like, I can tell you're not feeling right with yourself because you're acting crabby. Um, you know, those kind of things that our parents teach us are just um, precious. And that when, when we think about our mean, our mean grandmas, I mean, sometimes we have to be in this in the face of everything that we're dealing with. We have to come across as what is mean. But aside from a couple uh, exceptions, I think it always comes from love. Um, and I think that we as uh, Indigenous women and femmes, we have to find that balance um, with speaking our voice, speaking our truth, and stepping into our power, um, even if sometimes we have to be mean. Um, Let's see a couple other, oh, and men's roles. I mean, I think we do think, we do need to think about balance um, and the different roles of the genders that um, are in our communities and how um, when things are balanced, um, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but when we're balanced, everything's balanced. When humans are balanced, the land is balanced, our families are balanced. Um, when we were fighting line three, there was a story I want to share quickly, which is that we were putting up a red teepee to honor our missing and murdered uh, indigenous, our missing and murdered relatives. And um, it was a really hot day. And um, protocol said for that lodge in particular, the women had to put it up. 
And boy, the men were just circling around, you know, standing around, putting their hands in their pockets, rocking back and forth. Boy, they wanted to get in there so bad and they were talking to each other. They were, you know, pointing and they really wanted to jump in there. And they're talking about, do you wrap it this way? Do you put up your first two poles? Do you put up a, you know, and um, we told them, you know, your job right now is to support us. When we call you to come help, that's what you do. Um, we want you to sing for us. We want you to be um, around us and protect us. Um, and that was one of the most the most powerful times where I felt really supported by the men in our community um, because they were understanding their role as um, doing what we tell them. Me. Um, so <laughs> just kidding, not just kidding. Um, so that's it for what I want to say. There's a lot more. I have tons of notes, but I want to take the next um, eight minutes and see if anyone else has some closing thoughts or if something that came up that you really want to speak to. Um, remember, we are going to close exactly at 730. So um, keep it short. Thank you all. <laughs> so hey, everybody. In um, this position as a worker with the Indigenous Environments Network, I had a faux pas for I, I'm from North Dakota, but I'm calling in from Absalika territory, so Crow country in Montana. And I was really remiss not to um, um, say that in the beginning. And so deep apologies for the people whose land I'm on, even though I'm moving back to North Dakota soon here. And I wanted to say as you know, part of the work, if you're listening, I do have an ask. I've recently been asked to write some op-eds um, regarding um, the laurel methane plant, which is the first of eight plants that you're trying to build methane plants in Montana. So instead of going towards renewable energy, they're still trying to push that here. And so the way that you can get involved is to just go on the Northern Plains Resource Council site and you can find all the information about this wicked awful methane plant that since this is where i am you know fighting fracking at home but also fighting where i currently am you know for my two children and everybody here uh, look it up and and sign the petition about um keeping this methane plant from becoming a reality here thank you thank you hey um super quick we have a map of where everyone lives um, and we won't say where everyone, who, who, what, or, but we're just going to have uh, Sha flash it real quick. But um, if someone else wants to go in the last six minutes too, please feel free. But I love this map because it just shows um, the, like how far out, how far spread out we are and um, just the different experiences and territories and homelands that we all come from. Um, and it's really powerful when we weave all of that together and bring all of our gifts together um, in our work to um, take care of our Mother Earth. All the directions are represented on Turtle Island. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a, any last thoughts? We've got six minutes. Don't be shy. Yeah, I just, this is BJ. I just want to acknowledge not only our mates, if we have them, or our, but also our families in this work, supporting their mothers or grandmothers. We couldn't do this without them because they hold it down at home. Or as my daughter always says, she says, yep, taking one for the team, mom, you know? And, and, it, and it's true. So I want to acknowledge everyone's family and friends and whomever gives you strength in, um, in what we do and check. Thank you. Hey, we just got a few minutes, but I just want to remind everybody, if, if you heard something tonight that, that touches you, either whether it's geoengineering, fighting carbon, fighting the fault solutions of carbon offsets and carbon pricing, um, to, to any of the, the, from fracking to pipelines. If you find something, if you heard something tonight that's of interest to you, remember you can go to our ienearth.org, our website, um, get information there. You can also find us on Facebook and you can also find a lot of in, in information to our Indigenous Rising Media page up there on Facebook. Yeah, a lot of times there'll be like live stuff going on when we're at, at different demonstrations 
um, walks, runs, rallies, um, actions. Sometimes we'll, we'll be there, actions. Uh, so definitely be watching us. We, you know, we, we all have a, an email. You guys can, can, can send us an email if something's coming up in your territory. Or if there's a fight that you think that we should be aware of, you know, let us know. We want to know. Um, this is exciting. We we are here to help you find your voice, uplift your fights, and uh, do what we can do to keep building our network. Doksha. Thank you, Joy. I I have um, some stuff to say, um, like last like last minute things. As Candy had told um, told you, way that I am a youth. I have a couple years left of my youthness before I transition to becoming a full mentor to um, the younger youth. Um, just want everybody to remember about your youth in your communities and try to help uplift and bring up their voices as well um, in all of these different fights. So please remember that. And I am a two-spirit. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. So don't forget about your two-spirit members and your communities as well. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Morgan. Eva, do you want to take it away with our last thing? Do you see the chat? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> we are we are looking for topics. We want to know what everybody's interested in. Um, we're hoping to cover a wide variety of of uh of topics and and uh conversation in the next year so and we are having them on the new and the full moon um so if there's anything you'd be interested in in hearing a uh, conversation uh from uh from the women two-spirit gender non-conforming uh femmes of ien uh, please put it in the chat down there somewhere and uh, let us know thanks thank you and I want to send a lot of love to all of you. I know that it's late and we all have stuff going on. This is the first time we've ever gotten our women, our femmes together. And I appreciate the idea, which wasn't mine. So thank you <laughs> for putting out the idea. I love all of you so much, so dearly. It's just hard to describe. Just really appreciate all of you. Great, Candy. Any last one more minute? Remember, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just sending out my love to everyone and I really appreciate our team so much. I just feel like there's hope for the future, especially when I get to see, um, you know, all of your beautiful faces and all of the diversity of knowledge and information and hard work that we carry and be kind to yourself, love yourselves up, you know, do what you need to do to take care of yourselves. Um, because this is hard, this is hard work, um, you know, we need to find joy, humor, good food, music, art, all of those things that keep us strong and keep us going. Um, being Indigenous also means fun, it means laughter, it means joy, it means joking, it means good food, it means like teasing, um, <laughs> all of those things, we have all of those tools um, for us, you know, all of she those tools for us to use. Find joy, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> we should have a game called find joy it's a while though <laughs> again sending love to our, our 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 women that couldn't be here tonight sending a lot of love to you jen um where you are and prayers up for you and your family and also you know joe k and others that are um on our team that do contract work um tamara sending love to those that just aren't here with us right now and chelsea Chelsea as well. Go ahead. I was gonna throw in my you know, nope. just also sending love to the new moon. It's a new moon in Aquarius. If you are um retrograde observers, you know, we're in the shadow side of retrograde. So don't make harsh decisions, be gentle, relax. If you like to follow and uplift um black liberation and black struggle, today is the first day of one month of what should be celebrated every day. Um, and also there's a wonderful site called uh, the Nat Ministry, which is hosted by Black Femmes that talk about rest. So please check out that site, it's on Instagram, <laughs> but also remember to rest. And that this period of the next two weeks is about rest and restoration. 
and about grounding into your own decisions and leading from the place of your most knowing. And so it's a wonderful time to connect with your own matriarch and to lift and carry that into the new and full world. All right, that's a beautiful place to end. Unless anyone has one last thing, I wanna make sure. I just wanna acknowledge anyone out there who is celebrating the Lunar New Year today as well, um, as we enter into the new year uh, for our Asian American and Pacific Islanders. All right, Any, anyone else? All right, well then we'll end there. Um, miigwech everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to us.